Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the third lecture of three for this semester series of lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. Uh, this series was started in the spring of 2021, and we're thrilled to be continuing it. And I'm excited to tell you about this series and to introduce you to our amazing speaker, historian Dr. Shanette Garrett-Scott from Texas A&M. So my name is Keith Hollingsworth. I am a professor at Morehouse College, but this year I'm very thankful to be on sabbatical and to be a visiting professor at Princeton with the Keller Center teaching a class on Black entrepreneurship history. So it's a fabulous opportunity to be up here and be involved in this. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation innovation skills and networks to propel for positive and sustainable social societal impact, excuse me. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systemic racial inequity in our country and how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is that our community has an understanding of these systemic inequities as they work on solving some of humanity's most pressing uh, challenges. And that brings me to this series of lectures. For all interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting constraints. For at the end of the day, this is the core of entrepreneurship, assembling limited resources for impact. Black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, threats of violence and death, threat to theft of intellectual capital and many other extreme challenges, and yet they still thrive. These entrepreneurs have created innovations which have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the black community. So by exploring the history of black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies black entrepreneurs employed to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on black entrepreneurship and business development have limited the overall economy not only of black communities, but of our society as a whole. Now, so many of these constraints which have become institutionalized can be overcome in the future. So this exciting series of talks uh, brings together scholars and academics from numerous institutions around the country to share out their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. Uh, the title of Dr. Garrett Scott's talk is Dreaming of Colored People, Black Women in Finance in the Jazz Age. And before I do my bio and hand it over, I would ask that during the talk phase, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And if we have time at the end, I will ask your questions. So Dr. Garrett Scott is a professor at Texas A&M. We're so thrilled to have her here today. Her research focuses on late 19th and early 20th century race, gender, and capitalism. Her first book, Banking on Freedom, is the first history of U.S. banking and finance that centers on African-American women. Her next book project, tentatively titled Black Enterprise, re-examines the American dream as a touchstone of national self-understanding through the experiences of enterprising men and women in the National Negro Business League. She currently serves as the National Vice Director of the Association of Black Women Historians on the Handbook of Texas Women Executive Advisory Committee of the Texas State Historical Association and on the board of the Labor and Working Class History Association. So again, we're so thankful to have her here and Dr. Garrett Scott, I will pass it over to you. And you're on mute. There awesome. Are. So I am so excited to be here and, um, and um, to be included among the really fabulous guests that you have had already this semester. Um, and I will just jump in so that we can, can get started. Um, my voice is a little weak, but I have my little hot tea right here. So I'm pretty, I'm ready. It should take me maybe about 35 minutes or so, half an hour or so. So hopefully that leaves us lots of time uh, for questions. And I really, really do look forward to your questions. So I'm gonna start the slideshow and then let us commence. Alrighty, so the title of the talk is Dreaming of Colored People, uh, Black Women in Finance in the Jazz Age. And thank you again to everyone who, uh, is, who came out today. Charity. Charity hesitated a moment before she stepped onto the dusty dirt street. 
What am I doing, she thought to herself, suspended in the streetcar door between her old life that lay behind her and stepping into this awful new place. The smell of this new place, the noise, the people, just buzzing, so many moving and pressing and flitting like the flies rising off the mounds of horse manure lying in the street. This was 1885, Manhattan, in the heart of the Tenderloin, and Charity paused for a while, the mostly empty seats of the streetcar beckoning. She glanced back. What would she return to? Eight dead babies in two handfuls of years? All of them taken from her. No, there was no there back in Virginia. So Charity drew in her breath and planted her feet on the unforgiving ground. She dared not look back at the 16 tiny handprints, the baby's breaths misting, then curling off the streetcar windows, eight dead babies calling her back home. Lulu, Lulu hesitated a moment before she stepped onto the wooden floor, worn slick by hundreds of dancers, black men with even blacker burnt cork faces, clowns, singers like herself, even a man riding a one-wheeled cycle who seemed to defy gravity. The stage lights hummed, the people murmured, pressed tightly together in the hard wooden theater seats. They sounded like the sudden roar of wind whooshing and jostling the leaves. Now this was Harlem, 1916, and Lulu paused for a while, the full up theater beckoning suspended there at the edge of the curtain between the noisy backstage goings on, the expectant audience just beyond the lip of the thick velvet curtains and the quiet space at the center of the stage, a pocket that she could pour her voice into. So Lulu drew in a breath and planted her feet on the expectant uh, theater floor, stage floor. As she stepped into the light, darkness swallowed up the side of the stage where she had stood only a moment ago she dared not look back at the emptiness, that nowhere place holding on to silence. Now, Charity Jones and Lulu Robinson Jones, her daughter-in-law, had very different experiences as migrant women who moved to New York City in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but they did share something uh, important in common. They shared not just Charity's only surviving child, a son, but also a devotion to the Independent Order of St. Luke, which was a secret society that was founded in the mid 1800s by a free Black woman for Black women. So St. Luke would become one of the most successful Black controlled and one of the very few largely women controlled financial institutions in the country. At its peak in the mid 1920s, the order boasted 100,000 members in more than 25 states nearly 200 employees, the overwhelming majority of, of them were women, and assets equivalent to over $30 million in modern day dollars. So today for about 30 minutes or so, I'll be speaking about this world of Black finance in Harlem before the 1929 stock market crash, so in the jazz age. And I'll focus on one company a venture that involved both Charity Jones and Lulu Robinson Jones, and that company was the St. Luke Finance Corporation. Headquartered in Harlem and organized in the 19 teens by the New York District of the Independent Order of St. Luke, the St. Luke Finance Corporation reflects the opportunities that opened for Black women in U.S. finance by the 1920s. So there was this complex tapestry uh, that was made up of thousands of black controlled financial institutions. Um, this tapestry included formal banks, 
insurance companies, as well as thrifts, savings clubs, industrial loan associations, credit unions, even finance companies. And these uh, companies, these institutions were controlled, uh, they controlled millions of African Americans dollars, and they expanded the boundaries of their dreams. During the first great migration um, around World War I, however, an increasingly urban and northern Black population really taxed the capacities of these financial industry, uh, in, uh, institutions, revealing the tapestry as frayed and worn in places and the boundaries of those dreams fixed. So Black women used financial institutions like the St. Luke Finance Corporation, institutions that they led and that they controlled to challenge the constraints of Jim Crow and sexism. They experimented with these really innovative ways to raise capital, but they struggled with inexperience, uh, pressure from regulators, and even criticism from within the, black com uh, the very Black communities that they tried to help. Now, through the St. Luke Finance Corporation, I uh, will take this time here to explore how Black women used finance to carve out possibilities in the U.S. economy and society and to try to understand how wealth, value, and risk, these notions, uh, shaped and were shaped by gender and race. Now, for the St. Luke Finance Corporations, the strategies it chose to promote reflected some of these anxieties about Black women's bodies in urban spaces, these anxieties that became really heightened during and after the Great Migration. The investment priorities of the corporation reflected these conflicting attitudes that saw Black women as both the victims, but also the sources of social disorder, as, as people both in need of financial protection, uh, but also in need of new economic opportunities. So working women really uh, pressed their demands. They pressed their desires for better career options and housing choices, and they also rejected these efforts to police their behavior and their leisure choices, you know, in, especially in these urban spaces. Um, and they uh, grew weary of these pitches uh, with among enterprising African Americans that promoted you know, investment as a marker of citizenship, but implied that men really were the proper producers and consumers of these investment products. So I, you know, explore these kind of tensions throughout my book, uh, Banking on Freedom. But here, like I said, I'm just going to focus on one small aspect, and that is the St. Luke uh, Finance uh, Corporation and, and one of its really important projects which was the St. Luke Hall. So it is 1916 and the struggling New York district of St. Luke's, which is headquartered in Harlem, has elected a new president, a, a man named Dennis Grice. And that's a picture of him up there. Now the Harlem St. Luke's had $3.45 in its coffers, but it was more than $400 in debt. Now, Grice may have been the formal hand at the wheel, but an ambitious group of women controlled the labors. In 1918, 21 members of the Harlem St. Luke's incorporated the St. Luke Finance Corporation, and they set their sights on investments in real estate. Women made up six of the seven members of the finance uh, company's board. Lulu Robinson Jones, who was widowed by 1909, chaired the advisory committee. Jones solidified um, the chaired this advisory committee. The revived Harlem St. Luke's turned to Charity Jones to help recruit new members. And Charity Jones solidified her status. She was known as, quote, the mother of St. Luke in New York, uh, end quote. So membership in the New York district soared um, in part because of the Great Migration. And of course, the, the Jones women's women 
But it was not just the Jones women's um, charms alone that fueled this resurgence in Harlem St. Luke's membership and its fortunes. Their square focus on addressing the needs of Black women lit the spark that revived the order. So here, because of time constraints, I cannot really develop, you know, the full flower of the term, but let us jump ahead to assert, and, and, and trust me to assert that these new Negro women of color, these new Negro women of color tested and expanded the boundaries of modern Black women, womanhood. And these women and their families, for example, desperately needed housing. Sorry, an alarm. Got uh, housing. Robinson Jones understood this dilemma intimately, I suspect. In the mid to late 19 teens, like many young Black women, she likely confronted squalid housing conditions, skyrocketing rents, over policing, and overcrowding in segregated sections of the city. So um, Lulu Robinson Jones was able to borrow $3,000 from the St. Luke Bank in Richmond, but the St. Luke's Bank's cautious finance committee, headed by none other than Maggie uh, Lena Walker, was likely either unwilling to invest more in this real estate scheme, or it was just unable to do so. Investment in New York real estate, even then, required considerable capital. And those capital demands, we have to remember, were compounded by the racial tariff that made the costs of credit and consideration higher for African-Americans than it did for whites. So Robinson Jones envisioned new and returning members as potential investors in this vision of the finance corporation. Robinson Jones herself was an opera singer of some renown, and she all, so she understood the business of leisure uh, in Harlem. She arranged affairs that combined entertainment and enterprise. For example, she organized a fundraising reception at Manhattan Casino, and the James Reese, uh, Jane Reese um, Europe's orchestra performed the music. So in just a few months, the Harlem St. Luke's raised enough money to secure a mortgage on a building. It purchased a former convent on West 130th Street. And you see it there on the far left. In 1921, just a few years later, it bought a second property, um, which was a 24 room apartment building on West 129th Street that was known as the Casanova. Or I guess that's a, a play on Casanova. In 1922, it remodeled that first acquisition, that former convent on 130th, and it had transformed it into the St. Luke Hall, which was now the New York St. Luke District's headquarters building. And the Harlem St. Luke spent the equivalent of a million dollars in modern day dollars to remodel St. Luke Hall. And the Gleaming Hall accommodated everything from pageants to union meetings. In 1924, the order uh, further added to its holdings by purchasing a third property that you see here on uh, my far um, right. And this property was a combination apartment building, restaurant, and retail store on West 139th Street near Strivers Row. So by 1929, in a little more than a decade, the New York St. Luke's went from being nearly $400 in debt to having more than $5 million, and this very conservative um, estimate of New York real estate. So they went from being nearly bankrupt, well, from being bankrupt to having more than $5, to, uh, five million in assets um, in, uh, in assets. So located in the heart of Harlem's Black community, St. Luke's Hall became an important center for business, for community activities and entertainment, and for vice. So Reverend uh, Richard Bolden of the First Emanuel Church called out St. Luke's Hall. He said that St. Luke's Hall was a place where, quote, bootlegging 
bold prostitution and cabarets belied its saintly name, and that's the end quote. And Frederick Asbury Cullen, who was the pastor of Salem Methodist Episcopal Church and the adoptive father of Harlem Renaissance poet, County Cullen, called St. Luke's Hall nothing less than one of the quote, hell holes of God, end quote. So it is very likely that tenants in the restaurant, in the stores, and the office spaces in St. Luke Hall and its apartments and its other buildings ran numbers games, which was an extra legal and highly profitable lottery gambling game. And as historian LaShawn Harris notes, numbers, this game of numbers, allowed working and middle class players alike the chance to pursue personal pleasures and, amu uh, and amusements while still preserving outward images of respectability. So let's recount. 1916, the Harlem St. Luke's are broke. In 1918, they create the St. Luke Finance Corporation. Within a few years, they make some ambitious and lucrative real estate investments. They are part of what made the 20s roar. And as the country, though, slid toward economic decline by the end of that decade, the, bo the board's failure to sell all of the finance corporation stock left it undercapitalized despite the fact that it claimed more than $10,000 annually in profits from renting space in the hall and the apartments, you know, in, in its buildings and, um, and um, office buildings, at least office space as well. So the order dipped into those revenues to fund other commitments, such as provide charitable assistance to nearly 500 families. Now, the district raised the equivalent of $1.2 million in modern-day dollars from a, a bond offering. The incredible amounts raised highlight a couple of things. They highlight the democratization, you know, of investment. Uh, and investing among Black communities. And also they reflect the commitment of working and middle-class people to self-help through investment in Black, uh, black controlled enterprises. Uh, indeed, in Banking on Freedom, um, I really try to place Black people within the kinds of investments in stocks and get-rich-quick schemes, you know, that made the 1920s you know, so uh, roared and made it so popular. But even I have to admit, $1.2 million? I mean, $1,000 loans and swanky affairs alone cannot explain um, the dramatic rise in, the, in Harlem's uh, St. Luke's fortunes. So amounts that large, I think, really reveal some extra legal, we'll say, of financialization. So allow me to kind of take a little tiny detour to talk about one of the St. Luke Finance Corporation's financing schemes, which was one of its bonds offerings. So first I have to stress that black women showed out uh, around World War I when it came to Liberty Bond campaigns. These Liberty Bond campaigns uh, worked to raise money uh, to support the war effort during uh, the First World War. Black women flexed their economic muscles through activities on the home front, including Liberty Bond campaigns. They raised millions and millions of dollars for the war effort despite overt discrimination from war-related organizations such as the Red Cross and the YWCA. And through their fundraising, Black women celebrated a kind of cultural pluralism, uh, racial pride, and they also pushed for civic inclusion, political rights, and the destruction of Jim Crow. So they were pushing for, they were really, these were really political acts. So their fundraising not only reflected their to help to uh, buttress their claims uh, on uh, U.S. citizenship, but they also um, really uh, stressed uh, that they saw their activities as, you know, uh, as, as part of civic inclusion, as an exercise of uh, political rights, and as a way to dismantle Jim Crow. So the St. Luke Finance Corporation's bond offering was similar, was similar to Liberty Bonds, but it was a different kind of animal. It resembled a combination of like a thrift 
club and a raffle. So the board solicited local um, St. Luke councils through, that, that were located throughout the New York district to buy memberships to the district's board of directors for a $100 loan. And then the finance company was going to pay back that $100 loan at the end of five years, you know, of course, with, you know, interest. So each new board member was then required to produce at least one other $100 board member. So as you can imagine, not only did the, this isn't quite the way you should go about financing a, a, a finance corporation, uh, but you can see you, you kind of the elements of kind of a raffle and, um, you know, Black institutional life of kind of being kind of brought together in an effort to raise these this million dollars, which to to re um, to re to model the St. Luke Hall. Official official records show that the advisory board raised the modern day equivalent of about thirty eight thousand dollars through this scheme. So it offered a second bond to the public several thousands of these so-called refunding notes. That's what they call them, refunding notes. So you purchase a refunding note, uh, um, this new thing they call the refunding note based on the success of these, these board of director memberships. So you purchase a refunding note for five in $5 denominations and you can buy as many of those as you want. And you get a couple of incentives for the $5 that you're investing. So first you buy yourself a membership in the Independent Order of St. Luke in New York. And second, your quote unquote investment is going to accumulate um, interest, 5% uh, compounded interest a, a year over five years. And um, so for $5 now, you can get a little over $6 five years from now. At least that's according to the compound interest calculator I used and I'm horrible with math. Um, so, uh, but basically, it's literally pretty much a 30% rate of return, you know, on your investment. So this offering feels a lot like the plans that Marcus Garvey used, for example, to capitalize the Universal Negro Improvement Association's Black Star Line of the Negro Factories Corporation and the Black Cross Navigation and Trading Corporation. And these were different corporations that were organized under the UNIA. So thus the refunding notes doubled as membership certificates and as a way to loan money to the order at the same time. So the district raised the modern day equivalent of more than a million dollars from this refunding note scheme. And the large amounts might also reflect, like I said, some extra legal, other extra legal financialization because the New York district's membership numbers did grow in the 1920s, in the mid 19 to late 1920s. But it seems unlikely that that number of people were purchasing, you know, a million dollars in $5 increments. Now, the notes may have been a subterfuge for money borrowed or even earned from a policy banker such as Casper Holstein, to whom millions of dollars of cash flowed each month. And, um, and you can also ask me, and these um, numbers bankers, the people who ran these really powerful um, numbers wheels, um, did earn millions of dollars a, a, a year, I'm sorry, a month. And they were important investors in Black uh, business and the Black community. But as the country slid toward economic decline, the board's failure to sell all of the corporation's stock left it undercapitalized and with adequate funds, despite the fact that it claimed these robust annual profits from renting space in the hall uh, and apartments and offices in its buildings. Also, some disgruntled members complained to city officials about the New York district's finances. Past investigations into the U Universal Negro Improvement Association's finance left the um, uh, finances left the creative financial schemes of Black fraternal groups vulnerable to state scrutiny. In 1928, the state attorney general began an investigation into the order. After two hearings, the judge determined the order insolvent and appointed a receiver 
who ordered the district to sell its financial, uh, its real estate holdings. So I started with uh, some images, which were not actual images of Charity and Lulu, but these are two of the, you know, the only two surviving images um, I've been able to find. I, there is another one of Charity that I found, but she's not looking um, straight on. So just as I imagined at the beginning of my talk, how Charity Jones and Lulu Robinson Jones might have felt moving to and through New York City, I can only ponder how they must have felt when their beloved order lost its crown jewels. Charity Jones must have felt particularly bereft at the losses because she lost her home. She lived in one of the remodeled apartments in the St. Luke's Hall, which they had prepared for her because like I said, she was affectionately known as the mother of St. Luke's in New York. And from her will, I know that when she died in 1929, she still did reside at 127 West 130th Street, but it was no longer St. Luke's Hall and that fact had to be bittersweet. Lulu Robinson Jones told a census taker in 1930 that she was not working. It is not, it's not clear to me how active she stayed in you know, St. Luke, but it is very likely that she um, probably never again held such a powerful position in a multi-million dollar concern. So rather than end in you know, a conventional way where I kind of just recap my main points and the like, I thought I would do something a little different and in particular explain his title, uh, Dreaming of Colored People. So dream books were very popular at the height of the numbers game. And, you know, just in the Q&A, you can ask um, me more about, you know, if you want to understand a little bit more about numbers. But again, it's a lottery game. So dream books were very popular. And it's, as you can deduce from the title, a dream book interpreted dreams. So it assigns certain numbers to certain elements of a dream. So say you were dreaming about a dog, for example. So you might look up dog and there would be this series of numbers associated with dog. I don't know, maybe 311 or something, some numbers. Um, or if you dreamt about a brown dog, you could look up brown and you could see the numbers there, but, but you get the idea. You would look up numbers based on dreams that you had or things that you saw and play those numbers and hopefully win some money. Now there's an old dream book um, that says this about a person who dreams about colored people. It says, quote, this is an excellent dream for all. It promises riches and extraordinary good health to those in business, great success, to prisoners, a speedy release, to farmers, good crops, to the brokenhearted courage, end quote. So Black men and women associated with the St. Luke Finance Corporation hoped to transform the lives of communities living in Harlem. So they dreamed of colored people and theirs was indeed an excellent dream. Thank you so much. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate that uh, presentation. So I do have uh, at least one question already in the uh, question and answer session, and I encourage other people to put uh, more. Um, but somebody here has sent, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I feel so proud to hear the story of these pioneer women. Now, this is a difficult question, I think. What gave these women the confidence, energy, and ambition to take charge of their futures and communities the way they did? All right, that is a great question. Um, I would say that uh, it's a, it was kind of a, a bittersweet, um, answer to that. So on the one hand, the bitter part <laughs> is the difficulties that African-American women faced. So, um, the lack of economic opportunities, um, what we called uh, kind of Jane Crow now, that African-American women experienced um, all of the um, kind of limitations associated with being African-Americans uh, under Jim Crow, which was a system of, um, of institutionalized um, racism, economic exploitation, segregation, um, and kind of a denial, a disenfranchisement, and a denial of their um, uh, of their political and, and civil rights. Um, but then they also suffered under the discrimination, you know, that 
because they were women, because they uh, uh, of sexism as well. And so com under those kind of two compounded um, kind of forms of oppression, African-American women, if they were wanted to keep their sanity and also build up their communities, protect their families, um, and uh, you know, uh, strengthen their uh, institutions uh, that, uh, that created uh, within their communities. Then they had to take an, an action within those constraints, and they, of course, had to en en envision lives beyond uh, what uh, Jim Crow and Jane Crow was telling them their lives and their intellect and their bodies and their uh, dreams were worth. So that's the the bitter part, and the sweet part is, of course, the um, you know, the, the, just the enthusiasm and the powerful way that African-American women, you know, built up um, their world despite the limitations, uh, you know, that they faced. Um, but, but I, that's always also just a difficult uh, question to answer because on the one hand, you know, I don't want to, you know, have what they call oppression porn, you know, and give the sense that, you know, Black communities are constantly, you know, suffering, you know, um, under the you know edicts of you know racism and sexism, but I do want to acknowledge you know the struggles that they did um, have while also really kind of promoting the joy you know too that they were able to create um, e even despite difficult circumstances. Absolutely. Uh, another question. So toward the beginnings of the presentation, you mentioned that the growing population in Harlem put pressure on the organization. Can you share more about how the demographic growth of Harlem shaped the organization mm -hmm. and great presentation? Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. Um, actually, what's happening in Harlem is because of the great migration, the first wave of the great migration is happening in a number of cities throughout the West, uh, Midwest uh, and in the North and the Northeast. Um, and so the kind of pressure that's being put on of these communities is that in places like New York, uh, New York City, New York State, um, if we think of some of the other really big kind of um, great migration sites, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, um, et cetera. In addition to, we always can't forget that the great migration also involved a movement of African-Americans from rural areas in the South to rural city, um, to cities in the South. So places like Atlanta, Durham, uh, Raleigh, um, uh, when you have such a large influx of African-Americans who are, you know, searching out um, new economic opportunities, uh, which is what's pulling them, you know, to the north and to the west and to the cities, um, and also escaping, um, you know, lynching and, and racial sexual violence, um, it puts a strain on resources um, in, in those communities, coupled with these already kind of uh, ideas, uh, pseudo-scientific ideas that circulate about African-Americans' innate um, lack of intelligence, Black women's um, you know, lack of sexual morality. Um, it, it's really seen as a crisis of sort that you have these tens of thousands of African-American people pouring into these cities and taxing the resources uh, in those areas um, so so um, that is part of what kind of creates a sense of crisis, especially among uh, state and local governments. But at the same time, it also creates a great opportunity because of the fact that many of these uh, communities are being kind of funneled into segregated areas of the city, you have this kind of concentrated market of people who need all kinds of services. Um, and you have enterprising African-Americans who rise up in order to provide uh, these uh, services. So that's why when I talk about um, Black Wall Streets, which I talk about in my book, and I definitely use S at the end, and I've done some you know, talks about them. Of course, we most people are really aware of Tulsa uh, and of course what happened in 1921, the, the race war there, but there were Black Wall Streets all over the country um, I, in my book, I talk about Jackson Board in Richmond, which was kind of one of the very earliest, um, in Durham, um, Haiti, um, in um, Detroit, it would be Paradise Valley, in Chicago, Bronzeville, in New York, um, you know, Harlem, in Little Rock, um, I think it's 
Seventh Avenue, I can't remember in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so, so wherever you have large concentrations of African Americans all over the country, you have these concentrated areas of Black businesses that provide every kind of service that you could imagine to serve these, um, you know, these, um, these, th these different uh, communities. And in my book, in particular, I talk about insurance, and I talk about how. Um, how insurance kind of abandoned African-Americans because of kind of racist science. But then when they saw just how lucrative these black, you know, insurance companies had become, then they wanted, you know, a piece of the pie. And we began to see a struggle between mainstream white corporations wanting a piece of this lucrative uh, black consumer market um, and which I think is kind of helps to fuel the activism, the economic boycotts and activism that we see in the 30s that then extends to the civil, modern civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s. I love that answer. You just went through just like so much of my class, right? Yeah. And that one answer. Uh, so another question, fantastic talk. Looking forward to get a copy of your book. You referenced the possibility of illegal activity playing a role in some of the financial success of the organization. Do you think the prohibition and the illegal distribution of alcohol in Harlem created a unique window of opportunity for them? I wouldn't even say it was a unique opportunity. Um, <laughs> because I would say that it was, it's always been an opportunity. My, I'm, re, I'm writing Black Enterprise right now, and that's kind of my COVID book. Because when COVID came, you know, I wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to the archives to do, you know, my uh, other work. But my next book, uh, the book I really wanted to be my second book is a book about bootlegging, actually bootlegging in the South. And, um, and even in the preliminary research that I've been able to, to do with that book, I've seen that um, African-Americans uh, production of liquor has always been well, source of anxiety uh, among uh, white communities, but uh, but a really important source of um, an economic uh, of revenue and, and power and influence in black communities. But in particular, yeah, the prohibition is was kind of a perfect storm uh, that uh, provided um, I wouldn't say a unique opportunity, but an unparalleled opportunity to uh, really profit from the sale of. Um, illegal blues, of course, and uh, one of the reasons that it uh, was uh, was so people by African Americans were so successful is that they were able to use their um, businesses, uh, 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 which were these kind of spaces that were kind of away from the white. Uh, surveillance of the state and the police, because these were business places like funeral parlors, like the St. Luke Hall, um, like uh, barber shops and, um, and beauty shops. These were places that African-American people controlled, they owned, or at least rented the space and were able to kind of keep their activities away from the, you know, the glare of, um, of the state and, um, and African Americans were able to translate skills and talents that they had learned as enslaved people, you know, as working um, uh, rural working people, and kind of bring those kind of booze making skills, for example, you know, up to the north and west and other places, and um, and profit from them like you know like no other. Uh, when I teach, uh, so I I teach a. LaShawn Harris's book, which is about the informal economy of numbers running, running sex work um, in, in, in Harlem between the wars. And I also show a movie called Hoodlum, which is about Madame uh, Stephanie St. Clair, who was known as the, 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 the um, queen of policy. Um, and it, the movie is about her, but of course, you know, she's not the central character, the male characters are, but, but, and, but if nothing else, that movie gives a real sense of the vibrance of life in Harlem, and the um, incredible wealth that African Americans um, commanded uh, at that time. And uh, then the last thing I'll say is that uh, Alelia Bundles, who's 
great grandmother, great great grandmother, I think it's great grandmother, was Madam C.J. Walker and has written the definitive book uh, on on her and of, of which they also made a Netflix series, Self Made: The Life of Madam C.J. Walker. Her new book is about um, her grandmother was is a uh, Madam C.J. Walker's daughter who was known as like the joy you know queen of Harlem. Uh, she was a millionaire you know, heiress who, um, uh, who ran a salon, you know, in, uh, in um, an intellectual salon in, um, in Harlem at the time, who was known for her lavish parties, her riches, and um, her support of Black business, as well as Black artists during and beyond the Harlem Renaissance. You know, to me, one of the fascinating things you think about, you know, the move from rural to urban, you see these communities. Um, I think it's hard to really quantify, at least from my point of view, the, the, the confidence Black people would have gotten from being in a place where you could see other successful Black people, mm -hmm. which you just didn't see if you were on a farm out in rural Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But suddenly you're in a place where you see successful Black business people. I mean, even if it is prohibition, but you're seeing successful Black people. You've got a community now that you can build these networks that you're talking about. I mean, I think it just is, it's hard to really, uh, I think, quantify the idea that the confidence booster that would have been for so many people to look around and see successful Black businesses, which you just wouldn't have seen. Again, if you're, if 90% of Black people lived in the rural South, you just don't see that many people around you. Mm -hmm. as you would have in some of these cities. That's one of the mm -hmm. things we talk about. And so my question, I, I'd like to ask a question now. So like the Keller Center, trying to think about how to take these lessons and talk to the students about innovation and design and taking these things into account, the things that could be designed in a way that turned out to be, you know, <clears throat> even if they're not always racist in intent, they turned out to be racist in, uh, in application. Or you think about entrepreneurs from your study of all the history and everything. What what lessons do you think we need to be teaching our current students in entrepreneurship, both black and white? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, but uh, before I answer that question, having come from Mississippi, uh, taught in Mississippi and taught a class and, and really learned so much about Mississippi, um, is one of um, about the Black Wall Streets is. Um, I also noted that even in rural areas on like market days, um, there were these particular spots that African-Americans, you know, congregated even in small towns or on market days where they could see, you know, other successful, um, uh, they could, they could, um, to trade, you know, goods and services uh, with each other. So there were these kind of almost mini um, kind of black business right. incubators, yeah. you know, even um, in, um, in rural places. And I would also say that really successful um, landholders in, in, in rural areas were, um, were, were important community leaders. And then you have, you know, important activity institutional basis like the Negro Farmers Conferences at Hampton and Tuskegee that really tried to get farmers thinking um, as businessmen um, at the time. And, and those Tuskegee Negro Farm Conferences are still going on you know, even to this day. And then the last thing I'll say too about rural folk is that the, uh, the, the economic, especially in Mississippi, the economic civil rights movement you, the use of boycotts, the use of directed uh, spending campaigns um, were, were really important political um, part of the political activism, you know, at that time. And, 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 and kind of the repression that we see in the South is really, is also a reflection of just how hard rural Black people continue to fight and press uh, against the constraints that were um, Yes. that face them. So I would say regarding innovation and design, I think one of the first steps is one of the steps that the Keller Center uh, is, uh, is, um, is, is taking, and that is to just bring to light these stories. When I was at the University of Mississippi, um, a good colleague of mine who we talked about, Dr. Milorad Novacek, um, was talking to the person who I think he's over like accounting, and he was saying how, you know, I do this work on Black insurance companies, 
And this person is like a foremost um, expert on insurance companies. And he admitted that he had no idea that there were black owned insurance companies and certainly was not aware of the rich history of how these companies were really kind of economic engines, you know, for the, um, for what Dr. Uh, Juliet uh, Walker calls the golden age of black business, that period from 1900 up to the great depression when black businesses really flourished at this phenomenal rate. So first of all, just, just recovering, unfortunately in the 21st century, we're still recovering, but just recovering um, the stories of these enterprising people uh, and bringing awareness to um, their innovation, um, they are th them as risk takers, looking really studying closely how they um, took advantage of the opportunities that were available to them, but how they also maneuvered in and out of the restrictions that they faced. Um, and I, I'll, in this, I would say too that understanding that as well, um, one, it, I think it will critique our ideas about what we have defined as innovative, what we have defined as risk, what we have defined as opportunity. Uh, I think it provides an important critique. Um, but at the same time, it also really it has, it allows a much more expansive way of thinking about, um, you know, what's my free enterprise, what's, what's really free and uh, and, you know, and who really, you know, has a chance and, um, and, and yeah, so I, I just think that it also Absolutely. gives us a, it's a critique and it gives us a chance to um, rethink our ideas. Thank you. I appreciate that. Another question, this will probably be the last one. Do you think that the 1928 investigation of St. Luke's was politically motivated? Did the prosecution of Garvey place other Black financial institutions under additional scrutiny? Yeah, definitely. I um, I I, I write um, a lot of actually about regulation. So uh, I've written a, as a, a, an article in Enterprise and Society about the effect of uh, regulation on the Mississippi um, ins uh, insurance, uh, a Mississippi insurance company, which was one of the first uh, Black-owned companies to offer life insurance. Uh, in my book, I have a whole chapter about the efforts of regulators to really take down the St. Louis Bank. I have a new article in uh, the Business History Review called All the Devils This Side of Hades, which is about Mississippi banks and regulators. Um, so it, it's very similar to, to, to what you mentioned. The regulations themselves are not necessarily racist uh, or, um, or, or racist, but the ways in which they are applied have the practical effect of really trying to dismantle these symbols of black economic um, opportunity. And uh, so on the one hand, I did have to acknowledge the suit and I'm still trying to find the actual suit um, that, was, that was brought to kind of learn a little bit more about what happened in 1928. Uh, and of course the prosecutors at the time would have said, well, we're getting these complaints. Um, you know, they don't care whether or not they're motivated, you know, by jealousy or by real harm, but they're getting these complaints and they want to appear to be responsive. Um, but at the same time, you know, they are also, they do have um, other agenda, uh, other ulterior motives uh, in ways to try to use what seem like colorblind regulations or the arm of the law in order to strike a blow against companies, black owned companies that they may see as being too powerful. And I do think that the UNIA, the investigations of Garvey um, kind of played into um, the need to um, really come down with a, a very harsh, hand, harsh hand um, on them. And then I also, with the very last thing I would say too, is that even with Marcus Garvey, and even when we think about the criticism coming from people within the African-American community, it again complicates our ideas about Black entrepreneurship to understand that African American communities are very diverse and that you have some, and, and, and also whenever you deal with self-interest, um, you, you know, there's a, a shift between people who are, who have their own interests that they're trying to protect and promote um, within the Black community and they sometimes clash 
and sometimes they um, dovetail with each other. Um, but but issues like um, you know the St. Luke Finance Corporation and the UNIA in particular really demonstrate the kind of complexities of African American business and understandings about the purpose and mission and vision of Black business within African American communities that have nothing to do with you know what white people, for example, you know, think about black business, but are all about how African Americans see the role of entrepreneurship, innovation, um, and opportunity within their communities. Well, I do want to thank you again for this That's presentation. Awesome. It's been mm -hmm. fantastic. I've learned a lot. I know we're getting some good questions. So thank you for being with us. We appreciate this and um, we will talk to you again, I'm sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, and thanks to everybody else who could come in. We're glad to have you. And uh, keep this in mind. We, this is a regular series. We will have uh, three more uh, sessions in the uh, spring, but we'll also have a session where we bring this semester's panelists to have a table, a round table discussion. We'll do that early in the spring and you'll get notice. So, so keep that in mind and pay attention to the things that are coming up. This is gonna be an ongoing series. So thank you. Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship. Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.